thanks everyone for joining the session today. I really appreciate you uh, coming along and attending the session. Um, I will keep my, my webcam off today as uh, I've got some network challenges that uh, keep popping up on my screen. But um, what we'll be talking to you today is um, <clears throat> about how to drive real business value for your organization using AI and machine learning. And um, I guess a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I look after our AI and machine learning partner business across Asia Pacific. So um, I guess before we uh, start talking about the business applications of AI and machine learning, I think it's probably worth us just level setting on some of the terminology. So um, at AWS, we have a really clear view on the taxonomy around uh, the different terms that you sometimes hear used uh, in, this, in this space. So we describe artificial intelligence as being kind of the, the catch-all phrase for any technique uh, that uses that computers use to mimic human behavior and intelligence. And that can be, you know, complex uh, solutions like deep learning and machine learning, or it can be simple rules-based solutions like, you know, if-then-else statements. As a subset of artificial intelligence, we see machine learning. And machine learning is, um, I, I guess, the process machines use to interrogate data and, and uh, learn patterns from that data, and then automatically build models, which you can use to predict outcomes based on the historical patterns from the data. And then deep learning is a subset of that again, which is focused around multi-layer neural networks. And it's typically uh, used for, for complex techniques like speech and image recognition. Now, having said that, my intent today is not to get into the, the technology at a, at a very granular level. In fact, I intend to talk much more at the, at the business level today. So I, I may use artificial intelligence, machine learning a bit interchangeably in the discussions today, but it's really um, holistically, we're talking about that artificial intelligence layer and how we can uh, apply it to our business techniques. So when we look at the uh, machine learning uh, ecosystem and the trends we're seeing globally. I think it's fair to say that we've seen a huge increase in the amount of spending that we're getting, uh, what we're seeing our customers uh, investing in AI and machine learning, uh, particularly in APAC, but globally as well. And you can see their IDC says that uh, global spending will reach 110 billion around AI and machine learning uh, by 2024. And um, that's really evident in what we see in, in the Asia Pacific market. We've seen a huge increase in the, in the number of projects uh, involving AI and machine learning this in the last 12 months. And that's across uh, um, you know, all regions, uh, Australia, New Zealand, India, ASEAN. Um, there's been a, a very significant uptick. The second trend that I guess we're seeing um, coming into the market is a real shift. So maybe 12 to 18 months ago, we saw a lot of companies uh, doing proof of concepts around AI and machine learning, and it was very technical in nature. Could could AI and machine learning, you know, really work to solve a problem? Um, we've seen that shift quite dramatically this year, uh, moving away from sort of the technology projects to very business-oriented projects. Um, the use cases being led by business stakeholders, uh, solving real core business problems for, for organizations. And those organizations are expecting real ROI from those projects. So um, very much thinking about how to get this into production from day one, which is a great shift. Now, we still see most projects start with a proof of concept, but very much moving into production is the intent going forward. Um, and I guess we're at the inflection point. So we're starting to see Moving from those you know, individual use cases where um, you know, a, a business problem needs to be solved and we're using AI and machine learning to solve it, we're now starting to see companies say, from a top-down perspective, we want to transform our business using AI and machine learning. And you can see the Deloitte um, indicating that 57% of businesses thought that AI would transform their business in the next three years. Um, but yeah, we're starting to see companies adopt a much more holistic view of how AI and machine learning can be applied across multiple dimensions in their organization. And, uh, and that's really where we want to take uh, th this story today about how you can think about that across your organization. So obviously, every time we talk about AI and machine learning, from a business perspective, we have to start with the business goals. And as leaders of an organization, usually those goals are around growing new revenue streams around driving cost and efficiency, with a cost out of your business and efficiency gains within the business and lowering business risk. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can kind of apply um, AI machine learning to create new revenue streams in some of the case studies we talk about uh, later in the day. 
obviously, um, you know, operational efficiency is key. And that's usually, to be honest, where a lot of companies start their journey because, you know, they're looking at existing business processes and saying, how can I make that more effective? And that's probably the easiest place to start. Um, and business risk. So business risk can be on multiple dimensions. It can be things like, um, you know, credit assessments and, and using AI to, to lower financial risk. Um, but it can also be things like health and safety. And, and um, you know, we're seeing a lot of use cases, particularly in the in the APAC market, around using things like computer vision to identify, you know, when an employee might be not wearing their, their protective equipment on a work site or maybe too close to some heavy um um, machinery that uh, puts them in a dangerous situation, or perhaps their, um, you know, COVID use cases where they're not wearing masks or not socially distancing. So, you know, depending on how you define risk, um, there are lots of different ways that AI and machine learning can be applied and is being applied today to, uh, to drive risk out of business. When we look at machine learning, there's really, I guess, four dimensions to the types of benefits that machine learning are, are driving for organizations today. Um, the first one, obviously, we touched on a little bit before is, is around optimizing um, and driving business efficiency. You know, things like um, using AI and machine learning to drive uh, forecasting and demand planning is something that we see a lot of in organizations. And, and that can be forecasting, you know, sales and, and stock and inventory requirements, but it can also be things like forecasting energy consumption or forecasting uh, labor um, consumption. So even from a, a sustainability point of view, if you can forecast your energy usage and minimize that, that can obviously drive cost out of your organization as well. Also, farther, faster and smarter decision making is, a, is another benefit of, of AI and machine learning. So one of the things that AI does really well is it takes large amounts of data and analyzes that data quickly to produce in Sites. Now that could be something like identifying um, a fraudulent transaction in your in your uh, you know credit card uh, transactions. It could be um, analysing customers who are likely to churn. And the sooner that you can get that information and uh, and make uh, 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 action to address that, uh, the sooner you can kind of get the benefits of that um, and you know potentially stop customers leaving or in fact you know. You know, maybe it's a you know insight around price optimization. You could potentially change your price of your of your products and actually drive greater sales and profits. The third uh, aspect of of AI and machine learning is around adding AI and machine learning to existing products to add value to those products and make them more effective. A great example of that is around personalization. So quite often we'll see uh, customers, you know, with their websites where they're selling products and services, they add personalization recommendations to those websites to surface more relevant content to their customers. Um, the customers get a better experience because they're seeing the products and services that they're actually interested in. And obviously as, a, as an organization, you're hopefully driving greater sales as a result of uh, creating those personalized recommendations. So, you know, a simple way to use AI to drive revenue uplift. Um, and obviously, lastly, you can create entirely new products and services. And, and you know, at Amazon, you know, we, we use that all the time. Things like uh, Amazon Alexa or the Amazon Go stores. Um, and, oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. And um, I guess Amazon has a... Uh, rich history of using AI and machine learning. So they've been using AI and machine learning in, in our business for over 20 years. Um, you know, if you are familiar with using the amazon.com retail store, you know, you'd be familiar with the product recommendations that you get there. Um, obviously, it's a, a huge uh, store with lots and lots of products. You can see there are over 4,000 uh, products sold every minute. Um, but, you know, that the recommendation solutions that we have there, not only do they recommend the products that you know we feel are most appropriate to the individual user, but if you click on a product, we'll recommend like products um, that you know other people have also been interested in. So you know, really helping you um, get the right products recommended to you, and you know, making sure that we're not recommending products that are not in stock and all of those types of things. As we move into the fulfillment side of the business, our fulfillment centers deal with millions of packages every day, as you can see. Being able to use our forecasting solutions to forecast the amount of demand for products in those facilities, making sure that the uh, automated picking um, through the robotics in the in the center is, is picking those products in an effective manner, um, you know, is really driving efficiency into our overall global supply chain. And it helps us deliver on our promise of same day delivery or two day delivery, um, you know, through 
the likes of the Amazon Prime uh, offers. With uh, Alexa, you can see, I mean, obviously Alexa's handling in every home, there's probably an Alexa these days, uh, you know, it's handling billions of interactions with, uh, with people every week. Um, you know, that's speech recognition. It's also surfacing content for, for um, customers. It's making recommendations about things they might like. So it's a really integrated uh, solution um, of how you can bring AI and machine learning together to create a service for a customer. And then not only are we using robotics in our fulfillment centers, but you know we've also started using robotics in the term, in the form of drones to uh, to facilitate our, our prime air delivery function as well. So you can see um, the way that Amazon thinks about AI and machine learning is how to embed it in every product, every service, and every part of our business. So with all of that learning, what have we done? Well, we've, we've started to build solutions for, for our customers that help, uh, I guess, make it easier for you to adopt some of the more uh, common use cases that we see across the uh, across our customer portfolio. So, you know, when we look at the, the common use cases that are out there, you know, there are really three buckets that we see. The first is around, you know, those solutions that are enhancing customer experience. And we, we talked a little bit about personalization before, so I won't dwell on that, but that's that's obviously an extremely uh, important use case. And Amazon Personalize is there as our solution to, to help you solve that. Contact center intelligence is another, you know, really prevalent use case. So, you know, almost every company has some sort of contact center where customers call in looking for support, looking to place orders, whatever it is that, that they're doing through that contact center. Um, you know, what you want to do as a company is you want to make sure that your customers are serviced in the most optimal manner fashion. Um, time frame uh, possible um, and you know a lot of companies are using virtual agents or chatbot solutions to deflect the simple queries uh, away from the, the uh, human agents and allowing the human agents to focus on the more complex tasks and the more difficult uh, fulfillment of those uh, services. In addition to just using chatbots to, to deflect calls and, and answer simple queries, we're seeing contact centers um, often transcribing the call content, the, the discussion between the customer and, and the agent, and analyzing that content, trying to understand you know, things like, was there a customer complaint in that that needs to be logged and managed? Um, you know, was the sentiment of the call, you know, positive or negative? Was the, um, you know, was there some regulatory compliance questions that needed to be asked on the call and what were the answers to those? So, for example, uh, I know in the utility sector, um, it's very important when signing up a new customer to understand whether that customer is on life support so that obviously, you know, their power doesn't get cut off if they don't pay the bill. Um, so being able to track that that question was asked and track the answer to that is really important use case. Um, media intelligence is another use case that we often see quite uh, prevalent. So, you know, most companies these days have a lot of content, uh, you know, whether that's training videos or, you know, imagery or whatever it is that they're, they're dealing with. Um, you know, we have media services to analyze that content, you know, look at things like, is the content appropriate? They have content moderation services to identify, you know, is there nudity or violence or drug use or something in, in those contents? And obviously you can, you know, prohibit that from your side if you need to. Um, analyzing what's in the content for classification purposes, uh, potentially um, sporting companies using it for actually uh, sport field analysis, tracking players as they're running around the field and, and kind of measuring where they are, um, you know, in, from a performance point of view. So lots of capability around media intelligence and content curation there as well. When you move into the optimization of the business scenario, I mean, there are, again, lots and lots of use cases, but the ones that really stand out, um, intelligent search. So most companies have a website of some description where they're trying to surface uh, content for their customers. Um, using intelligent search where you can query in a natural language sense, um, you know, and the customer can ask questions uh, on that website and get direct answers rather than just general web pages referred to them um, is a, a much more effective uh, kind of strategy for that. And our, our solution, Amazon Kendra, is our intelligent search solution there. Um, a great example of that was for one of our insurance customers who allowed customers to basically ask, you know, does my policy cover this scenario? Um, the the uh, search agent would go back, look at their policy and actually answer their question for them as a part of the process. A much more compelling customer uh, experience there. 
Intelligent document processing is a really big use case. We see this everywhere. It can be things like processing uh, invoices or purchase orders, any physical documentation where you need to extract do um, content out of those documents and then, you know, perform some subsequent processing on it. A great example we deal with a lot is, you know, things like uh, people applying for new home loans. Um, they obviously have to submit bank statements and pay slips and things to, to justify those those loan applications. So they can uh, have that, that information extracted from those documents and interrogated and processed to accelerate the time it takes to process the loans. Fraud detection obviously is a, is a great example and that covers uh, multiple industries. Business metric analysis is, is another thing that we see a lot. So whether the, you know, your business metric might be sales volumes, it might be website traffic, it might be interf interface uh, volumes coming through an interface. Could be all sorts of different metrics, could even be um, information coming off equipment from an IoT uh, perspective. But understanding those metrics and then optimizing those metrics to improve performance, uh, potentially identify issues before they occur. So if you get a spike in website traffic, you wanna make sure that you're not gonna crash your website um, so, you know, making sure you identify those issues before they become really, uh, you know, critical. And then I guess lastly, moving to that sort of innovation acceleration uh, use case. So a lot of the time, you know, we're seeing customers who've started their ML journey, maybe they've built a few models um, and, you know, they're on open source environments, perhaps they haven't been able to get them into production. Um, what we do see is a lot of work around this ML ops concept where people are looking to build um, an industrialized pipeline for, for managing and migrating their, their models from development into production and then monitoring them in production and being able to iterate and retrain those models and deploy updates faster and with more agility to create new business capabilities rapidly. We also see, and I think, you know, those use cases are, are sort of fairly, you know, generic and available to, to lots of different industries. You know, from an industry perspective, you know, we can see that those use cases apply, you know, to multiple industries. And, and it's easy, you know, if you look in this vertical sense to kind of get a feel for how they might apply. So without draining this slide, I guess, you know, you could look at the scenario of finance and say, well, what use cases are going to resonate there? Obviously, fraud detection, identifying fraudulent transactions is probably one of the most important things for banks and, and credit card companies. Um, things like credit decisioning, making sure you, you understand how much to lend someone, uh, whether or not, you know, they should, should approve a loan application, those types of things can be done. Um, um, to accelerate that that loan application process. In the retail sense, it might be, as we said, recommending products or forecasting demand, or it could even be um, things like price optimization. So helping you know forecast the correct price to sell something at in order to optimize sales. Um, from manufacturing sense, we, we often see things like predictive maintenance being a really important use case there. Obviously keeping your manufacturing facility running efficiently is critical. Um, and early detection of any anomalies coming in from data off equipment is, is a really uh, key use case. Quality inspections, another one. So using computer vision to identify defects in, in products coming down the assembly line rather than manually assessing that. Obviously, computer vision gives you a lot more scale and reliability to the way that you do that. Um, and then obviously, we talked about health, uh, health and safety workplace um, kind of scenarios as well. So, um, you know, I think it's it's very clear that uh, AI machine learning has a lot of compelling use cases a lot across every industry. Um, there are some challenges, however, in terms of uh, kind of implementing AI. And, um, you know, the big challenges that we see in the market, I guess, is, you know, there's more and more data being created. And AI and machine learning needs that data, but the data that's being created um, you know, the, the theory is that there'll be more data created in the next three years than there was in the preceding 30 years combined. So, you know, when you're looking at um, does my existing data store, you know, will it scale to handle that kind of, uh, you know, scale of data? You know, are the data stored in one integrated place where I can actually access it and interrogate it with something like AI and machine learning, or is it stored in multiple data silos across my organization, you know, with different governance and different ownership? Um, is there uh, the ability to store the different types of data that's in the market these days? I mean, it's not all just sort of numerical and text data, there's video footage, there's audio data, there's click stream data. Um, and you need to be able to um, store that data in a way where you can bring it all together um, and use the necessary uh, combination of that data to drive value. Um, so there's a lot of challenge in, in doing that and using traditional architectures. 
Um, the other thing we see, obviously, machine learning requires some unique skills. It does require some data science skills, machine learning, engineering skills, um, and they are in short supply in the market. So there's no doubt that the, uh, the lack of IT of you know, machine learning talent in the market is 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 a challenge, um, and there's also a cultural shift required to implement um, machine learning. It's very much a uh, experimental kind of uh, development cycle, and and a lot of organisations struggle to adopt that. So we see a bit of inertia in that. And then lastly, I guess, with all of the focus on data security and privacy and regulatory compliance that's uh, happened over the last few. years, Years, um, you know, even if you have the data, being able to leverage it and access it uh, effectively can be a challenge for you as well. So we we look at um, helping our customers drive value out of their organisation by talking about this ML journey. Um, and you know, obviously, we start by saying, you know, it's important to get your data in order, right? We we would recommend you start with a data strategy, and in that strategy, you think about how you modernise the, you know, how your data restored so you have the ability to scale appropriately to to handle these new volumes of data and new types of data and when you think about machine learning almost 50 percent maybe more of the time in getting a model into production is around data data cleansing data preparation and and uh, labeling uh, and and curation so um it's it's important that you get your data right first then secondly, it's important to understand where to apply AI and ML. So it's about having a framework within your organization to identify opportunities, working with the business to understand the problems that are most important to fix, the ones where there is a meaningful ROI associated with resolving them, and the ones where there is uh, executive stakeholder buy-in to drive them through so that, you know, as, you know, projects require sponsorship to get into production, you've got someone there who's pushing that through and, and making sure that you actually realize the value. In terms of developing your team, most people often think about, as I put my team together, I need a data scientist and I need some ML engineers and some data engineers, and maybe a security person. And all of that's true. You do need that technical side of the team, but you also need the business analysts in the team. You need the people with the domain experience to be able to talk to the data scientists and explain to them about what is the problem that needs to be solved? What is the value that you're trying to achieve from a business perspective? What is the right data to source in order to build the models to actually you know, kind of come up with a solution that's going to solve that model and then validate that it has in fact solved the, the solution in a way that's meaningful for the organization. So ensuring you have those business specialists in the team is critical. Then we'd recommend you create this uh, ML culture in your organization. And this needs to be led top down. You do need executive sponsorship. You do need the organization to embrace the fact that with machine learning, you are going to be iterating and experimenting and some projects will not be successful. Others will be very successful. You need to see that as a learning process and take a really long-term view of, of success in your organization. The funding uh, for programs needs to reflect that and, and understand that not every project is going to uh, yield a positive result. And you also need to understand that unlike traditional IT where uh, a solution that's implemented is at its best on day one and depreciates over time. With AI and machine learning, you're building a solution that's probably at its worst on day one, but it's going to learn and improve over time. And uh, and therefore, you need to continue to invest and iterate and evolve that solution um, to get the most out of it. And lastly, we would say just take out all the undifferentiated heavy lifting. We see so many companies uh, starting the ML journey, sort of building solutions from scratch. And, you know, it's it's really unnecessary. You don't need to worry about sort of what infrastructure am I going to host this on? How do I scale it? Um, how do I build out the base level functionality like, you know, speech to text as an example? Those solutions we have, they're built ready for you to leverage out of the box. We would recommend that you use our managed hosted services so you don't have to worry about things like scalability and you just focus your time on, you know, really building the business functions that are going to differentiate you and deliver most value. As we move into the AWS lens on this, um, what I would say, this slide here gives you a complete view of the AI and machine learning stack for, for AWS. So the way we think about AI and machine learning is a four layer stack. So at the bottom, we do have infrastructure which is completely designed to run AI and machine learning. So we have uh, machine learning instances preloaded with containers and frameworks which are 
optimized to run on those uh, on those instances for AI and machine learning workloads. We have uh, chipsets for inference. We have chipsets for training um, that are, you know, if you really have uh, extremely high volumes and extremely high performance requirements, you can build the models right down at that bottom layer to get absolutely the most performance you can out of the solution but we would strongly recommend that unless you have a very clear requirement there that you don't start there we would recommend that you start if you're going to custom build a model we recommend you start at that ml platform level using our end to end solution called SageMaker, which is designed to let you custom build a solution from everything from collecting data and labeling data up front to building the model to training the model tuning it and deploying the model and then monitoring it and managing it in production. And with SageMaker, I mean, we have solutions here to help you debug problems if they if they come up. We have problems uh, solutions to help you identify uh, bias in your data, a bias in your model after it's been deployed. Um, if you want to deploy a solution to the edge, we have solutions to help you uh, reduce the size of the model so it will run at the edge, and then monitor and manage those models at the edge. So. It is one integrated solution that will help uh, accelerate the time that your, your data scientists are spending building models. And the, the less time they spend building models, the more time you can iterate and get new models into production and more value out of it. If possible, though, we'd prefer you didn't build models at all. What we'd really like you to do is leverage our pre-built AI services to actually um, accelerate the time that uh, it takes you to get solutions into, into production. We have in the AI services level, we have basic, uh, I guess, capabilities, if you like. So Amazon recognition, as an example, is our computer vision solution that does things like content moderation, object detection, facial recognition, uh, facial comparison, uh, you know, all, all sorts of pre-built services um, you know, out of the box. And the idea of it is you can just take that with an API call and integrate that into your, your solutions. No machine learning. Um, experience required. Equally, we have uh, Poly and Translate, which are speech to text and text to speech services, Lex for chatbots, and a whole range of text services there. Textract, which is our OCR, Comprehend, which is our natural language processing solution, and Translate for obviously um, language translation services. So we would not recommend that you build those services. We recommend that you leverage those pre-built services if you can to accelerate. What we've done most recently is we've taken those services ourselves and we've integrated them into business solutions. And um, I guess, you know, rolling that up as an example, you'll see intelligent document processing as an example in the in the top box, which is a combination of Comprehend and Textract to help you um, ingest documents and analyze those documents uh, quickly. We have some pre-built services like we talked about before around personalization, uh, forecasting, fraud detection. We also have services which are industry specific. So you can see that the healthcare and life sciences services on the top right there. So we have a, a data lake which is pre-built for the health industry um, using the Fire V4 map for format, um, so it's compliant with the health industry. Um, we have um, transcription and comprehension services which are trained on medical content and, and terminology. So again, they are uh, appropriate for identifying things like uh, medical treatments, uh, symptoms, um, you know, kind of drugs and things that are used in the medical industry. Um, and we also have our industrial uh, solutions. So we have um, IoT solutions which will uh, do anomaly detection on, um, you know, IoT feeds coming in from equipment to, to detect if a pump or an engine or a turbine is, is not performing correctly so that you can do predictive maintenance on it. We also have our computer vision quality inspection services pre-built as well. So, um, you know, we strongly encourage you to use those top uh, layer services if you can. And if you can't, then you know, use SageMaker to build out the, the services below that. Um, I won't spend a lot of time here. I guess I just wanted to, uh, I guess, <laughs> reiterate. Um, if, if you are using those AI services, the value is in the fact that um, there is no machine learning required. So firstly, any developer can use them with a simple API call. Secondly, they are managed hosted services. So they are, you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. Your, your uh, developers can just call the service. They don't have to worry about scalability. They will automatically scale for you. And as I said, there's no point you building those foundational capabilities like object detection. Leverage those services out of the box and then get your, uh, 
development team to be focused more on how do you apply that to the individual business use case to actually get the competitive advantage that you're looking for. Okay, so that's conceptually how we do it. Um, you know, we talk about AI and machine learning like it's new, but but AWS has more than 100,000 customers using uh, machine learning on their AWS platform today. So, and some of the biggest names in the world, you can see the likes of GE, Lyft, Domino's Pizzas, all sorts of uh, very significant companies leveraging AI and machine learning on our platform. What I thought I might do is take just five minutes before we wrap up to just talk about three uh, local use cases, just to give you a sense of how some of the um, APJ customers are using our services here locally. So uh, if I jump in Bolt Tech, Bolt Tech are a um, uh, insurance technology company. So they built technology to help insurance companies. Um, they had a use case where basically what they wanted to do was automate the, uh, I guess, the claims that people were making around broken uh, mobile phones. So basically the, the process was um, manually was that if you had a, a broken mobile phone, a cracked screen or a, a you know, damaged screen on your mobile phone, you would take it into a store. They would assess that. They would work out whether it could be repaired or replaced and then they would process the claim. With the introduction of, of COVID-19, obviously taking your phone into a store became very difficult. So what they wanted to do was try and automate that so people could do that claim processing at home. They went to one of our partners, Diaz, and asked them to build a model. So what uh, Diaz did was they conceived a process where the user holds their phone up to a mirror and then basically using two different machine learning models, Diaz uh, created a model that actually help the user take the appropriate photo. So holding the, the, um, holding the phone at the appropriate height, closeness to the mirror, et cetera, to get a, a good quality photo. Um, one model assessed the quality of that photo and then the second model assessed the damage on the screen so that the, it would then detect whether the screen was cracked or shattered and needed to be completely replaced. They then integrated that solution into a application which, um, uh, they called, I'm just trying to think of the name of it, Click to Protect, I think it was called. Um, and uh, then basically what um, Bolt Tech did was then they on-sold that application to six of their um, global insurance providers who are now using it in four different countries around the market. So, you know, that solution, obviously machine learning solution uh, was, was a great solution for solving the problem, but it also created an entirely new revenue stream for Bolt Tech, a, a new product that they could sell onto their customers. Um, car Next Door is a car sharing platform here in, in Australia and uh, basically what happens is people never, you know, the people who are renting the car and the people who are, you know, providing the car never meet, it's all done online um, and the idea of it is that, you know, you rent the car, you use the car, you bring the car back to wherever you got it from, you know, clean with, you know, full petrol, you know, all the rest of it. Um, obviously, things being what they are. People who rent the car sometimes don't bring it back clean. Sometimes they don't bring it back with petrol. Sometimes they don't bring it back at all. They leave it somewhere else. Um, sometimes it's damaged. Sometimes they get speeding fines, parking fines, all of those sorts of things. So Car Next Door, you know, really, it was important to them to identify these users who potentially would, um, what they call bad actors, but do something that was, uh, you know, uh, 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 unacceptable behavior with the car. So what they did was they went to Max Kelson and they said to Max Kelson, currently we have 250,000 rides a year. Um, what they do is they basically, um, when someone signs onto the platform, they do a manual background check. And if there is a problem, such as a speeding fine or you know damaged vehicle, then they investigate that. What they asked Max Kelson to do was actually build a model to predict based on usage patterns, uh, whether someone was likely to be a problem before something uh, serious happened to the, to the car. Uh, Max Kelson used Amazon SageMaker to build out a solution there that was able to very accurately predict based on, you know, kind of behavioral patterns. Um, you know, who was likely to be a, a, a bad user of the system. Um, what that did, that allowed them to uh, basically contact those users before something serious occurred. So maybe, um, you know, if they were deemed to be speeding but didn't actually get a speeding fine, then, you know, you could basically um, kind of contact them in advance. And, you know, if the actions were bad enough, they could ban them from the platform. What they've found is that that's uh, almost reduced the uh, inappropriate behavior on the platform to zero. 
and it's also increased their their customer confidence with them and it's reduced obviously the amount of manual processing of claims and and uh kind of complaints from customers substantially so a great result in terms of optimizing efficiency and improving customer experience